Welcome to a two-part series as we are going to break down both Rashomon and Inagrove. Today we're going to be covering Rashomon. Follow up for next week, we're going to be doing Inagrove, the two short stories that filmed one of the most important films in Japanese history, and that is Rashomon by Akira Kurosawa. One of the most important movies of all time. Very influential. All right, welcome to the Codex Cantina. I am Una. And I am going to have a good groove tonight, Crypto. No, no, we're doing, there? We're, doing, we're doing Rashomon first. Rashomon. Oh, totally failed that one, you didn't can, I? You can do that joke next video. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> that won't be as funny then, or maybe it will be. All right, be. so published in 1915 in Taikoku Bungaku. This is actually one of Akutagawa's, this is his third short story that he ever published. And at the age of 23, he had just graduated from a Western literature degree, some, some, some websites say English literature, from the Tokyo Imperial University. So very young in his career, and boy, did he unleash a, a monster of a good story, if you ask me. So he's more accomplished at 23 than I am my whole life at 40 <laughs> so far. Great. I feel wonderful already. Uh, now, I'm going to call out real quick that this is allegedly uh, heavily influenced from Konjaku Monogatari but I have not read those series. It's kind of like the Canterbury Tales of Japan. And also we're going to be doing our read along with Brad Proctor. So if you go to check out his channel, link will be down in the description below. Boy, do we have a lot to talk about in terms of starting with this story, Rashomon. I wanted to go through this first because the movie quotes in a grove as, as I mean, heavily, obviously for plot and character, it came from that. But in terms of setting and some themes that were injected into this movie that I find even even more important to extracting value from it uh, came from this story, Rashomon. So let's go through that today. All right. I'm excited. Now, this is, this is kind of outside of our usual zone where I would almost classify this as more of like a psychological thriller. Would, would you say that's fair? Oh, yeah, definitely. I love that. It is something that weighs heavily on mental health and right and wrong and own personal reflection it's just this vicious cycle of poverty and violence in kyoto that just gets kind of explored with this piece that i really really enjoy this story and in a grove are both available in the public domain i'll put a link to both of them for below if you want to read ahead for next week for this discussion but these are going to be linked where i'm going to i kind of structured these to have designed where i'm bringing kind of like an overview in this video that'll be used in the next one as well good good all right so in terms of plot a recently fired servant from a samurai is sitting at the rashomon gate and it's pouring rain. There's the crows that are usually there are gone. There's a cricket staring at him. And he's sitting here wondering what he's going to do with his life. He's He can either try to do the honest route and probably starve to death, or he can start thieving and steal from others to survive himself. So he's going through this big moment of what's he going to do with the rest of life when he sees a fire up at the Rashomon gate, and he's like, hey, there shouldn't be anyone here. Only the dead should be here, right? And we'll get into that in the, in the plot. So he goes up the stairs, and he sees like this ghoul hunching over these corpses, picking the hairs out of out of their heads. And he, he starts to draw his sword and try to capture her from escaping. And that's when he realizes it's actually an old woman that is plucking the hairs out of the dead. And the old woman kind of confesses that she was trying to take hair from the recently deceased to make a wig, sell the wig in order to survive. Kind of the same concept that this man was just going through. So the man just gets these, these feelings of hatred and he says, this is wrong, you shouldn't do that. And she says, no, 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 it's okay. This woman chopped up a snake and tried to sell it as fish meat to soldiers. So she was bad, so it's okay to defile her body. And he says, well, if it's okay to abuse the wicked, you also are wicked. He takes her clothes, kicks her down, and takes off from the Rashomon gate, having thieved from her in the same way that this woman was thieving from that, that corpse is, is kind of the overall plot that we're going for with this piece. Very happy piece. <laughs> so in terms of analysis, I want to start with this that kind of goes across both pieces. But uh, in terms of Japan, okay, the, we, we need to talk about the history here. So Kyoto became the capital of Japan in 794. Okay, Japan's had several capitals throughout the years, if you didn't know. And in that same year, they built the Rajoman Gate to kind of symbolize the great entrance into the city so that when foreign amb when ambassadors would come, they'd have to see this huge gate that was built and kind of 
have that representative of the state and pass through that to get into the city. Okay. Rajo means city walls and Mon means gate. But the problem is, is that Rajoman, Rashoman, however you want to pronounce it, was very easily damaged. Uh, throughout the years, winds, terrible storms would happen and it would damage this gate. And each year it became worse and worse. And it became a thing. Like this is reality where people would leave unwanted babies or unclaimed corpses at this gate to be buried by someone else, right? Like I'm leaving my problems at this gate. It's someone else's issue to deal with. It's kind of what this gate became in the actual culture of Japan. Hmm. Interesting. So eventually kind of monks nearby started to actually be buried at the gate as well. And eventually the gate was just in complete disrepair, complete ruin. It got torn down. Okay. They just, they just completely demolished it. And now there's just like a stone if you were to go there to say that this is where the Rashomon gate used to be. Fast forward a couple hundred years. Okay. Into 1867 when feudalism was abolished in Japan. And we, we moved from shogun to emperor. And what happened was the emperor moved the capital from Kyoto, which was the largest city in Japan, to Tokyo. Okay, and they've had a couple different names throughout time. But the people in Kyoto start to feel maybe not totally happy with this. They still view themselves as the capital legally and spiritually. But they start to lose power. They start to lose influence. It's now the eighth largest city in Japan as opposed to some of the other cities that kind of grew in power as a result. So think about that in terms of the gate. So Rashomon was slowly destroyed. It was the symbol of the city that was destroyed and the destruction of it over time. And also just Kyoto in general, the slow degradation of its status and wealth in the greater view of Japan as these things started to happen to it. Think about what those people had gone through. And that's really important is the backdrop, I think, for what Akutagawa was going for with a lot of the story. All right, all right. So next we need to go into some quick Japanese symbology because if, if I had read this story and you take out the word kimono, you take out the word rashomon and replace it with some other country's words, I, I could probably have told you this was a Japanese author just based on the symbology of the story. So rain isn't the same in the East as it is in the West. Yes, it's purification. Yes, just like baptism, Shintoism views water as a cleansing agent, okay? Okay. But it's much more prevalent in art there. It's not as oppressive when rain is happening. In Japanese art, they embrace rain a lot more. They embrace it so much that there's actually 50 words for rain in Japanese. You've probably heard the misnomer that there's like a ton of words for snow in Alaska. In um, Inuit, from, from from Alaska's perspective, there actually is that many words for rain in Japan. I can put a link below to some article that can list them all for you. That's pretty cool. <laughs> but part of that reason is that rain represents rebirth a lot more to the core of, of an Easterner than it is to a Westerner. Okay. And if you take that further in terms of the idea of rebirth, think of that from this man's perspective. He's just been let go. The way of life is changing in Kyoto. The, the gate's falling. The symbol of the city is falling. It could be argued that this man's status, whether it be let, you know, ripped away from a samurai's perspective, much the way that feudalism was ripped away from, from the samurai, you can view that this man's status was also left and changed as a result of all of this. So yeah, you could say like the rain, you know, coming down, washing away, he has to kind of like reinvent himself as it's washing away the old and new is being born, right? And you have an interesting quote here. He decided to spend the night there. If he could find a secluded corner sheltered from the wind and the rain. So while there's tons of this purifying rebirth rain around, he's looking for shelter from it. In a sense. Yeah, he doesn't want to be cleansed. He doesn't want to be cleansed in a sense. He was yeah. accepting the thief life, right? Let's jump into some animals real quick. So crows don't mean the same thing in Japan as they do in America. So Usually crows death can, for us, right? Death for us, for there it's a symbol of rebirth, but there's yeah. a very specific one called yatagarasu, okay? And that is divine intervention that can kind of show guidance. And you'll mm -hmm. notice there's, they said there's crows here all the time, except on this night. He's lacking divine guidance from the crow, yatagarasu, on the night that he's making this choice for rebirth. Or not rebirth, or choosing bad rebirth, maybe? Well, he's, he's got to choose where he's going to go, right? This is a yeah. rebirth moment for him, which is he going to be cleansed and go the pure route or is he going to go down towards yeah. the thievery route? Which path is he going to pick? Now, when we talk about snakes, okay, 
Snakes are also a symbol of good luck in Japan, it's particularly a live snake. If you find a snake, like particularly in a temple, like the Shinto priest will usher that snake away safely to make sure that no harm comes to it. Because if you find a bad snake, that's like super bad luck. So for Westerners that aren't super you know, familiar with Eastern traditions, like, oh, okay, so he's lying and selling snake meat to people pretending that it's fish meat. No, no, no. This is really bad to kill a snake specifically and then also lie and try and sell it to soldiers. That's that's huge bad, a huge bad omen in in, East, in Japan culture. Yeah, so defiling the uh, it's very symbolic good luck charm for them is going to be something that the man is going to harshly view her on. And a lot of people might miss that. I missed that the right. first read through until we discussed it. And you also notice the story starts out with a cricket. Okay. Your favorite. <laughs> we we got the cricket. My, my, I still got that cricket on the hearth over here, which is viewed as luck <laughs> and a sign of a good home here. It's Maybe you just sign. don't understand it, Una. Well, think of it this way. Seasons are very important to, to Japan. And autumn, while here, is beautiful. Oh, look at these leaves. I always point this out. Leaves are dying. Like they're. This is the death of this, this leaf right now, and you think it's beautiful. <laughs> Japan's more closely associated with that, too. It, it, there's beauty in it, too. Like, don't get me wrong. But they do view autumn as death. Winter is coming, right? All right. And you'll notice the cricket is viewing this servant right before he finds all of these corpses. Right as he's avoiding the rain, avoiding the rebirth and cleansing of this rain from a Shintoist perspective and not having the guidance of the crow on that particular night of which way to go in life. Makes sense. And, and then arguably, too, animals are an important part of the story because you have references to the woman being like a monkey. Uh, he hunched like a cat when he, I think he saw the fire and the, one, the ghoul, the woman, and crept like a lizard. There's a lot of comparisons of people to animals in a sense too and one of the big things that separates people and animals is is our morals our souls oh, that's right. stuff like that's that. right that's right and that's going to bring us into our next talking point but i did you know there are some more things in terms of like a blue kimono representing the working class this man was a servant and uh, him sitting on the seventh step in buddhism there are seven stages to um reincarnation so Take that where you want. But let's jump into the moral part because I feel like that's the huge driving force behind this and was like, I feel like a good bow on how Akira Kurosawa like directed that movie with the final scenes. Yeah, I think this is the the, the key nugget that we can pull out of the story here and it is definitely the driving force. All right, so the number one question, what ethical dilemmas is a person put into in the state of poverty because you'll notice we're in the middle of a pandemic right now, as you know, crypto. Yep. People might make decisions differently now than they would normally, right? It's once depravity enters your home, you find sin becoming a possible uh, uh, option, um, a more viable option in life, right? Yeah, if your children are starving and it's the question of them not eating or you making a bad decision, you're going to make the bad decision a lot more likely. When evil enters, it's a lot more easy to welcome it into your life when you're in a state of need, right? Yeah, when it's or necessity. So the man starts to contemplate this, right? We have the quote, what she did couldn't be wrong because if she hadn't, she would have starved to death. There was no other choice. If she knew I had to do this in order to live, she probably wouldn't care. So we start to see the idea of something's no longer immoral if I have to do it to survive, I, I it's okay to steal bread from the market if that's what my family needs to eat to live is, is the concept that we're starting to explore, right? And we have the guy constantly referring to the pimple on his cheek, which I think is a very subtle nod and play on, it's not a parasite, it's a hygienic disaffect and, and no issues if you have pimples, of course, but it's the idea of this negative festering thing. And that's how they're kind of starting to view and discuss societal things in Japan. Because in Japan, the whole is much bigger than the individual, right? You as an individual or a part as a whole is a much more important theme in Japan than it is in, in the West and America. In America, it's very me, 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 right? In Japan, yeah. it's very us, us, us. What's what's our society represent, right? Yeah, and here he's making a choice of is it him or an us, 
And if he chooses himself and the, the pimple festers and spreads, then does that make it easier for him to do worse things later? Right. I, I'm not sure Akutagawa had the best symbology here with that pimple, but I think that's what he was going for, right? I but, agree, um, yeah. It's subtle, but it, it's good. So the man, so so here's where the man's put to the test is when he sees that woman, the ghoul at first, it turns out to be a woman that's just also trying to survive. And he's just filled with hatred. He's filled with this festering desire that he knows that is evil. That is wrong to abuse your fellow man in that way, even though he's thinking the same thing a minute ago. And I think you can see this, right? Particularly in times of need, it's easy to turn the eye outward, to judge others, but are you yourself succumbing to those types of action? Choice, right? It absolutely is. And here he is trying to defend the dead woman's honor, even though, you know, it's said that she sold the, the snakes to, to soldiers, which is considered very bad in Japan. And he's got the choice. He's like, okay, I'm going to defend that honor. But then he makes his ultimate rebirth decision where he says, okay, if it's okay to do that to something that's bad, something that's negative, you know, living off of, of a healthy organism by, by doing negative things, being a pimple, if you will, if this woman's doing that to the woman that sold snakes, then I'm allowed to then thusly thieve from her. And he kicks her, takes her clothes, and runs off for his, his new person. This is... This is Japan decaying in Akutagawa's, I think, vision of the decay of society, the decay of the city, the decay of, of um, moralistically treating the whole better and not looking at the individual as opposed to prioritizing the individual. And ultimately thinking that this is going to make things better, right? Two, two wrongs making a right here. That's something wrong. I'm going to do wrong. Things are going to get better. We may be going in the wrong direction as a whole country, but things are going to get better eventually because we've made these sacrifices. And I think you see a lot of this influence into the end of um, the Akira Kurosawa film, Rashomon, where you have like the woodcutter who maybe made some bad decisions in terms of stealing the knife, in terms of lying in, in a court of justice, if you will. He decides to do the right thing at the time, which is to take care of the baby at that point in time. You know, and babies, like we talked about early, being abandoned at the Rashomon Gate. This was a very political commentary at the time. Well, I mean, obviously the Rashomon Gate had been destroyed. A political commentary on Japan of the time through past uh, events that you see it kind of explored a little bit there of maybe you're not always the best person. Maybe there are times that you succumb to the weakness of the individual but we have to put and think about society as a whole. And I think that's kind of where he's getting at with this piece of the cyclical decay and the need to kind of break that. It's explored more in the film than, than it is in the short story. The short story, he, he succumbs to the thievery and escapes, right? And it's that cyclical yeah. nature of Japan decaying, society decaying from a, a, a Eastern view. I think this is a great story. I love this story. Uh, I think that you could put it in perspective to what we're going through right now of people, you know, being me, 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 selfish, going out into society when if you look at the whole country, everybody, most people trying to stay in to try to fight what we're going through. Very similar correlation here between this story and what's happening in our country right now. Oh, yeah. So pretty cool. Yep. As soon as this pandemic hit, you saw people that went out and bought like 30 years worth of toilet paper. Like, I don't <laughs> know why toilet paper was the thing, but it was. Yeah. And uh, I've even seen like an image of a person returning like a cart full of toilet paper from Walmart. That's what this that's the ghoul in this story. That person that that is me, me, me. It's okay to to be the pimple on society, to take away from society. Um, I agree. Story's incredible. So we've done a lot of analysis on this story. Let's let's move towards more subjectivity of just this is just our opinions. Um, crypto, what were some of the things that you th you thought about when you were reading the story? Um so I think the story is uh, one of of morals from my viewpoint when I read it, uh, and I love how you know he's making this choice of well, if I do bad to bad, then that's okay. And uh, I, I thought that the the woman plucking the stuff out of the the corpses was funny. I know I'm not supposed to laugh at that, but I, I kind of got a chuckle out of that. Sure, uh, sure. It, personal reaction, no big deal. Yeah, and that that was that. Uh, I. You know, an ending can stick it for me, and 
I was okay with the how the guy chose what he did, but I was a little bit bummed that that's kind of the end. It, it felt not rushed. I don't think that's the right word. Uh, incomplete. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Like, I want to so, see what happens to this guy. You know, does, does he, uh, you know, go off and become a prolific thief? Or does the next guy, you know, take the kimono and beat his butt? I mean, uh, so I, I felt a little bit unfulfilled at the end. Still love the story, though. Now, for me, um, as a guy that has studied and literally had a minor in college and in Japanese East Asian language and studies, some of these things were more apparent to me, right? But but that doesn't mean I fully understand it. I am not from Japan. I'm not from the East. But I, but I like looking at cultures differently. I like looking at stories and problems differently. And I feel like this story did a good job if you knew the tools and had the structures to understand some of the symbology and some of the history of Japan at the time. For me, it opened up a lot of discussions that seem very relevant to today's now that um, we'll do our final ratings and the wrap up at the end of the month where, you know, do we recommend this video for you or not? But just in terms of like a personal subjective experience, man, I, I really enjoyed the story that I would give it personally like a nine for how it hit me specifically. Yeah, I think I would also, I want to give it a nine, but maybe I dropped like an 8.5 just because of the ending for me. But I I could easily be persuaded to give this a nine. It's a cool story and the symbology and the setting and uh, it just, it's good. It, it, as you said at the top of the video, it's a psychological thriller. And for a short story to be able to get so to get so wrapped up in a short story so quick is pretty cool. All right, guys, we are going to be following up with In a Grove for next week for our short story on Monday. Please consider checking it out. It is kind of the theme and plot um, inspiration behind the Rashomon movie. And uh, I think we've got a great discussion plan for that too. So thank you so much for checking out this video. Please consider subscribing if you like having literature discussions and are enjoying some of the, the angles that we're approaching this. We'd appreciate you on the journey. So Una out. Peace.